Welcome to our Advent Midweek series called The Peace of Christmas. Please join me in the opening dialogue. In this Advent time of waiting and watching, the words of the angel Gabriel break into our world, bringing a promise of peace. Greetings, the Lord is with you. Do not fear, for nothing will be impossible with God. We respond with Mary to the angel's message. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. We join with Elizabeth to greet the mother of our Lord. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. We echo Mary's song of praise. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. In this Advent time of waiting and watching, let us pray. Gracious God, you come to us in new and surprising ways. You make the impossible possible. Help us, like Mary, to answer your call that the light of Christ may spread to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. chapter 21, verses 25 to 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, 
This generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will not pass away. But my heaven and earth will pass away. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on the guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. Well, welcome to the first week of our Advent series, The Peace of Christmas. Our theme today is Who Owns the Cloud? Google or God? And the lesson from Luke's Gospel is a little unsettling. In it, Christ seems to be describing the end of the world. Remember what you just heard? There will be signs and the sun, moon, and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. People are going to fade from terror, apprehension of what's coming on to the world. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. Dogs and cats lying together. Oh, wait, that's from Ghostbusters. It's vivid imagery. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Nations in anguish. Hollywood, have a, Hollywood have, would have a great time with special effects to portray that scene. Of course, it is a scene that has been painted from many pulpits as a time of great terror. You may remember the minister who was describing his, this final day with great drama. Thunder will boom, he cried. Lightning will strike. Rivers will overflow. The sky will be in flames. There will be mammoth storms, floods, and earthquakes. And a little girl in the congregation looked up eagerly at her mother. Mommy, she whispered, will I be let out of school that day? Reminds me of the reaction of a well-known radio broadcast many years ago. Most of you probably know the one I'm talking about. You may even have listened to it. In 1938, Orson Welles broadcast a radio dramatization of H.G. Wells' story, War of the Worlds. The broadcast was intended to sound like the report of an invasion of the Earth by Martians. The broadcast, which was carried all across the U.S., was so realistic, it almost caused a nationwide panic. Actor John Barrymore was among those convinced that the Martians had landed. He managed to contain his fear until it came to a point at which the invaders were allegedly marching down Madison Avenue. Rushing out to the kennel in which he kept his 20 prized St. Bernards, he threw open the door, set them all free, and cried out, Fend it for yourselves! I'm glad he was concerned about his St. Bernards. But I'm sure he felt quite foolish when the truth came out that there was no such invasion. Of course, there have been other instances in history when Christian folks have gotten all stirred up by some misguided would-be prophet who has convinced them that the end of the world was at hand. Some of these good folks sold their homes, left their jobs, neglected their responsibilities, all because they believed that the end was near. It's interesting. Most of us think of Advent as that special season in which the church prepares to celebrate the coming of Christ at Christmas. It's a season of joyous anticipation. But there is a second Advent in Scripture, one that is far more disturbing. It has nothing to do with snowflakes and the visions of sugar plum fairies dancing in our heads. Luke describes it in our lesson for today. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Here's a mysterious image for you, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It's intended to be mysterious. Clouds are the biblical symbol for mystery. 
and of the presence of God. He is coming with the clouds, says Revelation 1, verse 7. Lo, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, said God to Moses on Mount Sinai. The cloud symbolizing the divine presence covered the tabernacle in the wilderness, according to Exodus chapter 40. The cloud shrouded the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, a place where the presence of God dwelt, according to Leviticus 16. And a cloud of glory, the very majesty of God, filled the Temple of Solomon at its dedication in 1 Kings chapter 8. A more familiar scene takes place in the New Testament. You remember it on the transfiguration story. Jesus with his disciples on the top of the mountain when a cloud wraps around them and they hear the voice of God. When the New Testament says that Jesus is coming in a cloud shrouded with power and great glory, it is a powerful symbol of mystery and divinity. Now, there are interesting words to interpret in a modern world. A voice from the cloud said, this is my son. We have a different kind of cloud these days. In today's world, we associate the cloud with computing and storage of files and videos in a place unseen. When tech companies say your data is in the cloud or that you can work in the cloud, it doesn't have anything to do with those fluffy things in the sky. Your computer data isn't, data isn't actually in heaven. It's stored somewhere here in the earth. Lots of somewheres, actually, all over the world. Amazon and Google have built a vast network of computer servers housed in huge warehouses in widely scattered locations, some the size of a football field. That's where the cloud resides as far as computer users are concerned, not on Mount Sinai, but wherever the tech companies can find sufficient power to keep their servers humming. The Bible tells us that at the end of time, Christ is coming in a cloud, but not the internet cloud. When Luke says that Jesus is coming in a cloud with power and glory, it's the biblical way of saying that at the end of days, Google or Amazon won't own the cloud, God will control the cloud and all the clouds that ever existed, and Christ will reign over them all. Now, the Bible is trying to tell us that we, as Christians, can be excited about the future. According to the scripture, all of creation groans, waiting expectantly to see not what Google will do next, or Amazon or Apple, but what God is going to do next. The future belongs to to God. Now the Israelites waited expectantly for the Messiah and the early church waited expectantly for Christ's return to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Christian life is an expectant life. It is a life lived in anticipation that the promises of God will be fulfilled. Who knows what grand thing God may be doing at this very hour? No wonder that for over 2,000 years, people have been trying to read the fig leaves, try to analyze the seasons, try to see the signs, try to determine when God's promises will be fulfilled. It's futility, of course. Jesus says no one knows the hour. No one knows what the mind is, is in the mind of God. Not even the angels. But we keep trying. People are always looking for signs concerning Christ's return. We don't know when that time will be, but we live in anticipation that God will do a good work and that God's promises will be fulfilled. We live in anticipation because we also know that God does not forget God's own. Much of the New Testament was written during the time of terrible persecution. Christians were burned alive in Nero's gardens and thrown into gladiator pits to be a Christian believer was a test of real courage and endurance. Much of the New Testament was written to believers to say, hold on, God has not forgotten us, God will come. During this special season of Advent, our Jewish friends will be celebrating Hanukkah. This celebration is a celebration of lights. They'll be lighting each candle in a menorah, a nine-branched candle holder. They'll be celebrating an event that took place before Christ. The event occurred during a time of Roman oppression. 
when after an impressive fight to recapture the temple at Jerusalem, the Jewish people wanted to relight the menorah at the altar and keep it going 24 hours a day. They had no candles, though, so they used the purest olive oil. Unfortunately, they only had enough oil to last one day. They knew that it takes eight days to prepare more olive oil of that purity. Undaunted, however, they lit the menorah on that first day and filled it with their one supply, one day supply of oil. They believed that by faith it would last until some more could be produced. And according to the story, it did. The one day supply burned for eight days. Miraculously, the menorah did not go out. Hanukkah, for our Jewish friends, is a sign in their history that God does not forget his people. And God's people of all times and places have always taken comfort in the knowledge that whenever life grows uncertain, dangerous, or difficult, we can look to the clouds, as it were. He does not forget or forsake us. Ours is an expectant life, waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled, remembering that God does not forsake his own. Ours is also an expectant faith for one more reason, and Advent is central to that reason. Advent reminds us that the victory is already ours. Now, you'll need to think a little bit about this one. Theologians speak of it as realized eschatology. It's a very fancy term. that means we can live now in the light of Christ's final victory, even though that victory is yet to be won. Here, I think, is a great example. Dan Bauman, in his book, Dare to Believe, illustrates how we experience tomorrow's joy today. He explains that at Christmas time, as a youth, he always did a lot of snooping, trying to find out the gift-wrapped presents and figure out what was in them. Some of you have undoubtedly the same, done the same thing when you were younger. Maybe still. Anyway, one year, he found a package that was easy to identify. The contents were golf clubs. His mother couldn't put enough wrapping on the clubs to disguise them from her sneaky son. But he made this observation. When mom wasn't around, I would go and feel the package and shake it and pretend I was on the golf course. The point is, I was already enjoying the pleasure of the future event, namely the unveiling. I had my name on it. I knew what it was. Only Christmas would reveal it in its fullness. That's realized eschatology. Enjoying the wonder and the mystery of the victory, even though it is yet to be accomplished. We live in a God-infused world. Even though the final victory is yet to be won, we live in anticipation and assurance. So, Advent is here. Let the watch begin. I hope you have that kind of expectancy in your life. Jesus said, At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Won't be Google's cloud, won't be Amazon's cloud, it'll be God's cloud. And everything that is bad about this world will be swept away and only God's love and mercy will be left. And the children of God will have every tear wiped away and joy will reign over all. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the God through whom all things are possible, grant you mercy, grace, and peace. Amen.